Take the wrong dialing of the right number. Nobody was more surprised than we were. Let me show you what we came up with. You take a typical desk set of a telephone, looked at from the top down, you got something that looks like this. And you have the dial over here. We took the dial off the telephone. We put something else in its place. Now something else that you all have around today but didn't exist in 1951. We put a hand calculator on the telephone. That is, we put a register and 10 buttons, one for each digit, plus an 11th button, in the corner. And the way you were going to use this telephone was as follows. You come to the phone, and you do not lift the receiver off the hook. You leave it there. You put your number into the phone by pushing the buttons. The number you push in shows in the register. Now remember, you got the right number in your head. Huh? You now look at the register. Is that the number you intended to call? If it is, you pick up the receiver and the whole number goes through at once. If it isn't, you hit the red button, which is a clear button, and start over again. <laughs> Eliminate the incorrect dialing of wrong, a right numbers, virtually. Well, we were so excited we couldn't contain ourselves. It was a little problem, though. We didn't know whether it was feasible. Remember, there were no hand calculators. The chip didn't exist in those days. So we called up the electronics department and said, we need some technological advice. Can you send some experts over? <clears throat> About a half hour later, two young men, looking as though they were fresh out of MIT, uh, came in and said, what do you want? So we started to explain to them what we were interested in and wanted to know whether this could be done. As we were describing this to them, they began to whisper to each other, consulting with each other, paying less and less attention to us. Now this was rude, but that's standard at Bell Labs. <laughs> but what they eventually did was not. They got up and left the room without any explanation. We were so damn mad we couldn't contain ourselves. And we decided not to chase them or the hell with them. You know, we went on to something else. Well, about three weeks later, these two young men reappeared in the room again, looking very sheepish and saying, look, we're sorry about what happened last time. You probably wonder what we did, why we left the way we did, and we'd like to explain. Well, we expressed some interest in knowing what had happened. So they said, you know, what you were telling us was really very exciting, but not for the reasons that you thought. You see, that wrong number stuff isn't very interesting, they said. But those buttons, <laughs> those are really a nice idea. So we ran out of here, went back, and built a telephone with push buttons. We have tested it on 2,000 people since we saw you. They said, you know it takes 12 seconds less to put a number into a telephone by pushing buttons than turning a dial? That's a 20% increase in the capacity of the telephone system. Over in our department, they said, we have started a project this week to develop that telephone, and it's got a code name. They said, we've decided to call it the Touchstone Telephone. Now, that's where the Touchstone Telephone came from, but that was only the beginning. In the course of the next year, we designed telephones that covered every single one of those 92 properties, and they were feasible. Those phones have all been built. They're not all commercially available, but they all exist. Many of them you know. The video telephone was a product of that. Teleconferencing was a product of that project. The fact that you can now go visit your friends and receive your phone calls there if you want them to is a product of that project. I have used a telephone the size of a hand calculator standing on top of a mountain in the Poconos, talked to Paris, France, had no wires, hung from my neck, it came with me, and when I was talking on the phone with somebody else was trying to get me, it told me that and told me who it was and allowed me to deliver a message to them without stopping my original conversation. All that's been done. Every major technological change that occurred in the Bell system since 1953 came out of that project. And most that will occur between now and 2000 will still come out of that project. It's going to take them that long to use all it produced. Incredible experience. That concept has become the core of interactive management and planning. Now, let me explain. 
It starts by taking the organization to be managed or planned for. <coughs> it can be seen there. It was destroyed last night. It no longer exists. The exercise is to redesign it from scratch. Developing a conception of the organization you would replace it with right now if you were free to replace it with any organization you wanted subject to the conditions I gave you. Now there's some additional conditions which are discussed in the book and I, won't, I don't have time to go into them now, but that's the fundamental idea. That is called an idealized redesign of the system. And that's the core of the process. You will stand there and say, how do I get back to where I am? Now let me show you what happens when you do this. First, when you engage in idealized design, it enables everybody in an organization to participate. Everybody. Why? In normal planning, when you say, what can be done to improve CNET? You can't contribute to that unless you know a great deal about CNET. You've got to be an expert. And experts are a subclass of the culture, the population, everybody can participate. What the hell can the janitor contribute? But when you ask about a system, what ought the system to be? then anybody who's affected by the system has some relevant opinions. There's no such thing as an expert on an odd question. So that I don't know anything about banking, but you ask me what ought a bank to be, boy, I got all kinds of ideas, because I got to use those damn things, and they're stupid. I would like to have a bank in which I could walk to cash a check where they don't treat me like John Dillinger, for example. <laughs> I would like to have a single account, not multiple accounts, the insurance arrangement on deposit, absolute not, and on and on and on. I can list all those things and yet I don't know anything about how a bank works. This has an incredible impact. Everybody in an organization can participate. Let me take an extreme case. A brewery in Mexico, a number of years ago, seven, eight years ago, started this process and decided immediately to give everybody in the corporation a chance to participate. 18,000 employees using tape like this, they were all exposed to uh, instruction on how to do it, set up in teams, and they went to work. Let me take two extreme teams. The top of the corporation was an eight-man executive group, and they started the plan to design the corporation over again from scratch. The very other extreme happened there were eight janitors in the brew house who also started the process. Were they doing the same thing? Of course not. You wouldn't be surprised by what the executives did. They did, but it comes naturally. They asked questions, what product line should we have ideally? Should we go beyond beer, have soft drinks, food, and so what markets should we work in? How will we finance the company? How should it be organized? Where should it be located? All the questions you would expect of the executives. Now the janitors didn't ask any of those questions. They didn't even know what a debt to debt equity ratio was or a debenture or anything like that. They did what they knew about. Now what did they know about? They knew about cans, lavatories. Therefore, the question that they addressed was, if the lavatories were all wiped out last night, we had to do them over again from scratch, what would we put in their place? And they came out with the most beautiful design of lavatories I have ever seen. Now, I have told this story to perhaps 500 groups of executives over the years, senior executives, and whenever I tell it, a benign smile comes across their face. This is very cute. And they say, yes. They say, but what's that got to do with corporate planning? And they say, yeah. No, after all, what have the cans got to do with corporate planning, right? Well, I just wait for them to say that. Because now I say, I want you to answer two questions. First, suppose I take the top eight executives of your corporation or your government agency, send them away for three months incommunicado, and lock their offices. What will happen to your organization? I always get the same answer. You know what it is? Nothing. It'll be there. It'll work. We can adapt. Okay, I say, now let's take the janitors, send them away for three months, incommunicado, and lock the cans. <laughs> you won't be there tomorrow. 
The simple fact is that the corporation or the agency depends a lot more on its janitors than it does on its chief executive officers. <laughs> now that's not the point though. The point is this, that no group of executives ever produced an organizational plan. They can't. What they produce a plan of is the executive function. You see, those cans are just as much a part of that organization as the debt to debt equity ratio is. And in a normal plan, it's never covered. Now, let me show you what happened. When they finished their plan, the brew house workers also produced a redesign of the brew house, which they were interested in. When we brought the two together to read each other's designs, I have never heard so much laughter in my life. It's the only time in my life I literally saw people rolling in the aisles. These little Mexicans were literally rolling in the aisles. Why? The brew house workers had designed a marvelous brew house for producing beer, but they forgot to provide any facilities for getting rid of it. <laughs> the janitors, on the other hand, had used so much space for these marvelous lavatories, there wasn't enough room to brew the beer in. <laughs> so they looked at each other and laughed and said, obviously what we got to do is get together. They did. They now produced a joint design that took care of both functions. Meantime, the packaging line workers over here produced their design, redesign of the packaging line. The quality control people produced their redesign of the packaging line because they were taking product out of it to test. When they were brought together, they had an incompatible pair of designs. So they worked on it together and produced a joint design. Then the four groups were brought together. And they didn't match. Turned out they had forgotten to get the beer from the brew house to the <coughs> packaging line. They had to redesign so they could get the beer from one place to another. They did it. Now, throughout the organization at every level, these horizontal interactions were taking place. And meantime, these plans, these designs were floating up the organization and down, influencing each other, and the planning group had the responsibility for seeing that no group did anything which affected any other group without them getting together and settling. What do you think happened to the janitors in this process? I don't mean they had fun. Of course, they had marvelous fun. But something else fundamental happened, which is a principal benefit of planning. Everybody engaged in this process began to realize how what they do affects the performance of the whole. And when everybody in an organization begins to use the criterion, the performance of the whole, rather than the performance of the unit of which he's a part, the improvement in performance which you create is incredible. And that's the principal benefit of this planning. It's the immediate improvement in performance that comes about by trying to improve the performance of the system as a whole, and not your part of it. Now all kinds of other things happen. I mentioned a few. This process generates consensus in an organization. Why? Because the further out you get towards ideals from immediate actions, <laughs> From immediate actions to the short run of the ideals, to objectives, the medium run objectives, the long range objectives, out to ideals. The further out you get towards that, the more agreement there is among us. <clears throat> most human disagreements occur down at this end of the scale. And I know most people don't believe that. <clears throat> the reason they don't is because of an unfortunate accident in the English language. The worst conflicts of which we're aware are ideological. But ideologies have nothing to do with ideals. They have only to do with means. I know you don't believe that, but you can convince yourself very easily. I wish there were time to take you through a test. Have you ever looked at the Constitution of the Soviet Union? It's almost exactly like the Constitution of the United States. You would be shocked to see how similar they are. The difference between the United States and the Soviet Union is not about ultimate objectives. It's about how you get there, means. Now, in this process, it becomes apparent to us that most of our disagreement is about means, not ends. And therefore, we develop an ability to negotiate lesser differences because we appreciate the importance of our having the same ultimate values. And that consensus that generates creates commitment. Let me just give you an example. In 1971 to 74, 
We worked for the President of France and his cabinet, that was Pompidou at the time, <coughs> to prepare a long-range plan for Paris first. There was a committee appointed by the President to work with us as the overseeing staff that consisted of cabinet members plus representatives of each of the 12 political parties of France, running from the extreme right to the extreme left. When the plan for Paris was ultimately submitted to the Cabinet of France in 1974, it went with letters of support from each of the 12 political parties. That was the first time in the history of France they had ever agreed on anything. That is literally true. They had never agreed on anything before. But they all agreed on what Paris ought to be. <clears throat> you won't be surprised when I tell you what they wanted it to be. They all wanted Paris to be the capital of the world. It didn't make a difference whether a communist or a fascist or in between. Now, they didn't mean capital of a world government because they didn't think there was ever going to be a world government. They had a very specific idea. There are an increasing number of institutions in the world which deal with the interactions of nations. They wanted Paris to be the principal location of such institutions. And they went on and designed the city of Paris around that concept. By the way, that plan's been in implementation since 1976. I'll show you some of the results of it as we go along. This process unleashes an incredible amount of creativity. Why? If I brought you together and said, look, the Navy Education and Training Command was destroyed last night, let's start over again. You know, your natural reaction would be, my God, what a stupid damn thing. You know, it's absolutely inconceivable. And I say, well, you've got to do it. And you say, well, if I've got to do it, I sure as hell don't have to take it seriously. So you may as well relax and enjoy it. That means don't take it as work. Play. Play. Have fun. And that's the secret to creativity. That's why kids are so creative and adults are not. Kids play and you work. If we can only get you to play, you'd be a hell of a lot more creative than you are. And if you force kids to work, they'd be a lot less creative than they are. The kind of things that happen when you start this process, which is so out of outrageous that you don't take it seriously, is you begin to discover that for the first time in your life, you're doing fundamental thinking about the system you care about. Let me give you an example. Working with a big bank in New York, corporate headquarters, there are 2,000 people in the corporate headquarters. They'd had three thefts from the bank by employees in the last six months amounting to $14 million. They had apprehended two of the groups of criminals. The third one got away, God knows where, Brazil or somewhere. When they were redesigning the bank from scratch, the focus was on security. Oh, they had television monitors everywhere. They were ma magnetically inscribing every document and then had magnetic ringers or readers. Every time you pass one, it would beep and you'd be inspected and so on. They were designing security in to the hill. In that meeting, I had one of my graduate students with me. I frequently have to do that in case I need an idea. So in the middle of this conversation, he broke in and he turned to the president of the bank. He said, can you tell me how these people got the money or the securities out of the bank? He said, sure. He said, it's just paper. He said, they put it in the lining of their suit or even in their lunch pail or a briefcase. He said, we don't inspect them when they leave. The kid said, well, why don't you? He said, you realize how long it takes to inspect a person for paper? You would have to take every sheet of paper they got and look at it to see whether it's a security or money. It doesn't take much. A security can be worth $100,000. Some of them a million. He said it would take 15 to 20 minutes per person, 2,000 people. We'd be here all night into the next day. You can't do it. While the student was subdued by that, he sat back and looked like he was sulking, and the conversation went back to television monitors. About five minutes later, he suddenly broke out unashamedly and yelled, I got it, he said. And everybody looked at him. And he said, everybody in the bank work in the nude. <laughs> now think about that for a moment. You know, it would solve the problem. You couldn't get away with very much. <laughs> and think of what it would do for marketing. <laughs> now, under normal circumstances, the first thing that somebody would point out is it can't be done, right? But that's not what happened. 
Why? Because these guys were playing. Nobody was taking it serious. Vice President of Operations said, now wait a minute, he said, that's a hell of an idea. He said, you know we don't need to have everybody work in the nude if we just get them in the nude right before they leave the bank. That's all we need. He said, how can we do that? 30 minutes later, they had the answer. A month later or so, a little more than a month, they installed it and they haven't had a theft since. You know what they did? They went to Paris and hired two of the biggest designers in Paris to design uniforms for everybody in the bank, male and female. Beautiful uniforms, several for each employee. They redesigned the entry of the bank. I'll just show you schematically. You come into the bank and you go into a locker room and you undress, you strip, and you go through a shower room which in the morning is not on. You can take a shower if you want to, but you don't have to. You can walk right through it. There's another locker room here where your uniform is and you dress and go to work. The end of the day, you come back and you reverse. Take your clothes off here, and now you can't go in through the shower room without getting soaking wet because it's running in such a way that there's no way of getting through there with anything on you dry. Huh? You come out here, get dressed, and leave the bank. No thefts. See, they're working in the nude. Now, that kind of solution never would have been found under normal circumstances. The creativity that's unleashed is absolutely incredible. Let me tell you one story which reveals why this happens. In 1976, when I was in Mexico, I got a phone call one day from the chief city planner of Mexico, Roque Gonzalez, who's an old friend of mine. And he asked if he could come to see me at my office with some of his colleagues. And at 4 o'clock he appeared with a huge roll of drawings and two of his young assistants. And he told me that the mayor of Mexico, Hank Gonzalez, had asked him to prepare a transportation plan. He wanted to show them to me and then he had a problem. He took about an hour, he showed me six transportation plans, alternative plans for Mexico City. He said, now here's my problem. He said, you know the mayor and I can't go to him with six plans. I gotta go with one. I wanna go with the best and I don't know which one is best. Can you help me pick out the best one? He said, yeah, I can help you, but not the way you think. He said, what do you mean? Now, fortunately, Roque was a very good friend because what happened next would have lost him if he hadn't been. I said, none of them are any good. He looked at me with a hurt look, shocked. He said, what do you mean none of them are any good? I said, oh, come on, Roque, you know that. Every one of these plans is based on a principle that has been used in other cities under more uh, auspicious and supportive circumstances, and they've always failed. And we know why they failed and why they have to fail in Mexico. He said, why? He said, you cannot solve a transportation problem by increasing the supply of transportation. He said, why not? Because supply always creates more demand than it satisfies. The more transportation you build, the more congestion you will get. He said, if that's true, then you can't solve a transportation problem. I said, oh no, that's not so. You can solve a transportation problem by reducing demand, not by increasing supply. He said, you can't do that in a democracy. I said, sure you can. He said, name one way. I said, okay, move the capital of Mexico out of Mexico City. He said, you're not serious. He said, sure I am. 45% of the people employed in this city are employed by the federal government. 25% are indirectly employed. The city's already got 17 million people in it. It's, it's absolutely strangling itself. For political and economic reasons, you ought to disperse the government of Mexico, get it the hell out of the city, and you would get more improvement in traffic than all six year plans put together. He said, of course, but you can't move the capital of a country. So what do you mean you can't? We did it in the United States twice. Oh, he said, come on, Russ, that was 200 years ago. That happened to be 1976, by the way. Uh, I said, all right, what about Brazil? He said, that was 40 years ago. I said, all right, what about Tanzania? They're doing it right now. Oh, he said, come on, Russ, that's Africa. He said, you don't understand. <coughs> Mexico City was the capital of the Aztec Empire. I said, I know that. What difference does it make? And he shook his head. He said, boy, if you don't understand the difference, there's nothing I can say to make you understand it. You see, you're just not a Mexican. And that was true. So we both sat there sulking. 
And after a little while, we're both embarrassed. He said, all right, you got any other crazy ideas? I said, yeah, change the working hours. He said, how's that going to help? He said, the official working hours in Mexico are 10 to 2 and 5 to 8. The three-hour period is called the siesta. So now we know two things about the siesta. First is 23% of all the trips taken to the city are taken going back and forth during the siesta. And if we eliminate even a fraction of those, it would be more improvement than all your six plans put together. Furthermore, the siesta is no longer used for sleeping, although the bedroom is frequently involved in what it is used for. <laughs> so what you want to do is reduce the siesta to a sensible one hour limit, and then you will have more relief of traffic than anything you have proposed. He said, of course, but you can't reduce the siesta. I said, why not? He said, that's an integral part of the Mexican culture. I said, that's no explanation. I said, when Cortez landed, you were killing 150 teenage boys a day at the top of the pyramid. You don't do it anymore. You changed the culture. Oh, he said, come on. He said, that's a ridiculous kind of an argument. I said, why is it ridiculous? He said, you want to understand you're not a Mexican. <laughs> now, I went through eight such proposals with him, <coughs> and every one was rejected because I wasn't a Mexican. Every one of them. Now, the reason I've told you this story is this. Two months later, Lopez Portillo was inaugurated as president of New Mexico. In his inaugural address on December 4th, as I recall, he made two announcements. The first was of the dispersion of the capital of Mexico out of Mexico City. He said, henceforth, there will be no new government buildings built in Mexico City. They'll all be built out. And as buildings become uh, irreparable, we will not replace them in Mexico City. We're going to move them out. We're going to move every damn thing out we possibly can as quickly as we can. Second thing he did was change the working hours in Mexico. In his first act in office, he did two things that the chief planner told me were impossible. Question, where was the impossibility? Right. In the head of the planner. In the head of management. The principal obstruction between where you are and where you would most like to be is what? You. That's awfully hard to take, but that's the absolute truth. It doesn't make any difference who you are. It's me. We are the principal obstruction between where we are and where we most want to be. The great American philosopher, the greatest American philosopher, Pogo, knew that. <laughs> Remember where Pogo's walking off to the woods and his friend says to him, hey, where are you going, Pogo? He said, I'm going to hunt the enemy. A little later, he's coming out of the woods. The friend said, you find them? He said, yep. He said, who is they? He says, they is us. <laughs> we are the principal obstruction to our own progress. Most planning is based on the fallacious assumption that the major obstructions are there, it, out there. And even if you succeed in changing all that stuff, you're not going to get what you want because you haven't touched the major obstruction, which is us. When you design what you would do ideally, if you could do whatever you wanted, you will go through a shock. And the shock is the realization that you could have most of it if you really wanted it, without anybody else's intervention. And it's that realization which has the biggest impact on an organization. When you finally realize that the future is largely under your control, you can do it if you want to. And you are the principal obstruction unless you are removed. That's what makes this thing so exciting. Because when you redesign the Navy or the University of Pennsylvania and the rest of it, whatever it happens to be, and you look at that thing, you say, oh my God, we can really have most of it if we wanted to. Your concept of feasibility changes. Look, in Paris, let me tell you about three proposals we made which were accepted. First, that the capital of France be moved out of Paris. Paris is the oldest national capital of the world. Do you know in 1976 the government of France accepted that recommendation? and has been moving the capital out systematically since to Orléans, and more than 50% of the capital is out of Paris now. The ceremonial stuff is still there, but the working part of the government's been moved out most of it. How come? 
We recommended that Paris be declared an open city, no longer subject to the government of France. Paris has the largest percentage of its nation's population of any city in the world. 42% of Frenchmen live in metropolitan Paris. Mexico comes next with 25%. New York only has eight. And yet they accepted it. Why? Well, the answer is obvious. I told you. If you want Paris to be the capital of the world, it can't be the capital of France. There's a conflict. If it's going to be capital of the world, it must be an open city that anybody can come or leave from without being subject to national control. Therefore, what is normally seen as infeasible, if I suggested just out of the blue, moving the capital of France, not only became feasible, it was seen as absolutely necessary. What an incredible conversion. What's the difference between seeing it as feasible and as necessary? The difference is all up here. Nothing happened in the outside world. And so they're doing it. The whole point of planning should be changing ourselves. Nobody can develop you, you can only develop yourself. Planning must be a method of self-development. Idealized redesign is the most effective method of doing that that I know of. Okay, let's take a break at this point and then we'll talk about it when we come back. Well, we're up to the last bit. Now, before we go ahead, um, let's take a little time to discuss any aspects of this central concept that I've just gone, taken you through. The idea of basing management and planning on a vision of what you would be if you could be whatever you wanted and working backwards from there to see what's the closest approximation to that you can in fact realize. Are there any questions or comments or observations you would like to make about that? No? Well, in the last section I've been asked to talk a little bit about education. That's very, very difficult. Because like you, that's a business we're both in. And it's very hard to be brief about something that you uh, spend a lot of time in and think a great deal about. Uh, so I want to try to say a few things that might provoke some discussion without trying to give you a lecture about something that you know a great deal about. First, let me point out that you have two words, education and training. They're quite different. Training is the conveyance of knowledge. It's instruction, teaching people how to do something. That's quite different from education, or at least what education ought to be. Most of education is a conveyance of information, it's description. It ought to be the conveyance of understanding, explanation, but it very infrequently is. Education as a whole is an archaic system, deeply rooted even today in the machine age. The model on which schools are based is the factory of the Industrial Revolution. You just think about it. You got a filtering process in which you take a very wide array of people and narrow it down as to an acceptable raw material which comes into a process which is then uniformly treated and operated on to produce a uniform output which is then given a model number and a trade name, brand name. So it's Wharton 85 or Harvard 36. All models, completely mechanistic. This process is designed without regard to the individual characteristics of the material going through it. The material has to adjust to the process, not vice versa. It's divided up into atoms, courses, curricula, programs, and so on. They're sequenced in a row. Even the students are usually organized alphabetically or according to size and treated like a group of items on a production line. If you look at a school dispassionately, it becomes clear that it's modeled after a typical automobile production and assembly line. It's completely inhumane. That would be bad enough, but it's stupid, which is much worse. Absolutely stupid. 
And that's the incredible thing about our culture that we will tolerate it. Let's just take a couple of evidences of this. The educational system is based on the fundamental assumption that the best way to learn something is to have it taught to you. And we know that that is absolutely false. Not only is it false, we know it is probably the least efficient way there is to learn something. For example, how did you learn to speak English? Nobody taught it to you, but I bet you there's hardly anybody in this room that can speak a second language decently, although you may have taken four to five years of it in school. Obviously, if you want to learn a language, you don't want to have it taught to you. It's a terrible way to learn it. How many of you have ever taught a course in a subject that you had never had as a student? How many of you have ever done that? Only a few of you? The rest of you will know the answer to the next question, even if you haven't. Who learned the most in your class? Teacher did. One of the most effective ways of learning a subject is not to have it taught to you, but to teach it to somebody else. We know that. Every teacher knows that. We got the damn schools reversed. The students ought to be teaching what we want them to learn. Who should they be teaching? The teachers. The teacher should be the students being taught. Now just think about this for a moment. I'll tell you about an experiment which proves what I'm saying. There has never been anything more inhumane done than computer-assisted instruction. It is absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> a number of years ago, I was attending a meeting at RCA, and they were extolling the virtues of their new program for computer assisted instruction in mathematics that had been de developed by Supies out at the University of California. Now, Supies is a brilliant philosopher and logician. I know him slightly. They showed me a film, an hour film, on the marvels of this process. And they were done, he said, uh, what did you think of it? I said, well, it's very impressive, but I got a couple of questions. He said, like what? I said, in the course of mathematics from which these photographs were taken, in what sessions were the films made? They said, what do you mean? He said, was it the first session, the second, the third, the fourth, or what? He said, what difference is it? I said, well, I'd like to know. Do you mind? He said, well, we don't know. We'd have to call Suppies. I said, well, there's a telephone. Why don't you call Suppies? So they did. So they got Suppies on the phone, and they said, what session were those films made? He said, the fourth. And then they turned to me, they said, the fourth. And I said, now ask them what happened later in the course. And then there's a long silence while they're listening. They said, the course was never completed. <coughs> Why? The kids complained so damn much that their parents withdrew them from the program. Can you imagine anything more insulting to a human being than putting him in front of a machine, telling him the machine knows more than you do and it's going to teach you how to do something? You know, what an absolute outrage to human dignity to be told that if you're real good, you'll be as good as a machine. What a stupid thing to do. Now, how ought it to be done? I'll tell you how it ought to be done. It's been shown, demonstrated. We did a project with Phil, Phil Co. Ford a number of years ago, which had tried for years to develop an effective program in remedial reading and an effective program in remedial arithmetic, elementary stuff, typical program, and none of them worked. They had developed them with Temple University for the Philadelphia school system. He said, you got it reversed. He said, what do you mean? I told him a story. In 1953, I was living in Cleveland, working at Case, and I had a good friend who was the headmaster of the Hawken Day School, which is one of the more exclusive day schools in, in the Cleveland area. Case had just gotten UNIVAC II. We were one of the first universities to get a large computer in 53. We got the Bureau of Census, UNIVAC II. By today's standard, it was absolutely incredibly complicated. You had to program it in machine language, and you know you had to air condition rooms because of the thousands of vacuum tubes, you know, archaic. But there it was. We were talking about it one day, and I was complaining to him about the underestimation of the capacity of his kids. He said, what do you mean we underestimated? We push them to the hill. I said, hell, you don't even know what the hill is. He said, for example, 
I said, why do you wait until I know all of arithmetic and mathematic and algebra before you expose them to the computer? Why don't you start them right off with it? He said, how can you? I said, well, it's easy. We could take your second grade kids and teach them how to use a Univac. He said, how will you do it? I said, we would teach them to use the Univac to do their homework. He said, well, what's that? Use the UNIVAC as a student and the student as a teacher. And their job is to teach the computer to do what you want the student to learn. It took four weeks to teach those kids how to use the UNIVAC to do their homework. Now, you can't teach a computer something that you can't do yourself. Therefore, if you want to teach it how to do it, you've got to know how to do it. Nobody taught them. They learned. And they did it themselves. Reverse the roles. Make the, the computer the, teach, the student, make the student the teacher. You have a perfect way of evaluating what the student knows. Hmm? Just see what the computer can do because he's taught it whatever he knows. Another one. Remedial English. They couldn't get it right. We took three tables and arranged them in the triangle like this. Put a computer terminal on each one with a keyboard. We have a student sitting here. They can see each other, but they can't see the face of each other's terminal. The terminal would come on and give them an incorrect English sentence of some kind. Okay? Uh, the boys uh, has a book, or the boy has books. The instruction was to correct the incorrect word. Each one of the three students independently had to correct the incorrect word. When they're finished, the computer comes back and says, two of you were right and one of you was wrong. That's all it says. Well, how do they find out who was wrong? They got to talk about it. They talk about it. They can use any references they want to, but they got to find out who's wrong and get it corrected, and they do. Put it back in the computer, and it will come back and say, well, there's still one of you wrong, or you're all right, and then come out with the next question. The computer is used as an instrument to facilitate their learning from each other, not from the computer. It becomes truly their instrument for learning, not their teacher. And it works like a charm. In our program at the University of Pennsylvania, which was originally started in the 70s as an experimental program, we have no courses. We eliminated all courses. Our learning is done through what we call cells, groups of students and faculty who negotiate to come together to jointly learn the subject they want to learn. Now, for example, a group of students came to me about a, two years ago and said, uh, we would like to have a cell on planning for development of less developed nations, third world countries. I said, fine, that's a good subject. They said, there are a lot of faculty that have done work in that. We said, right, five of us have done work in that area. They said, would it be possible to arrange for a cell with all of them in? We said, of course, yeah. I'll check with them, and I did, and they were all willing. And they said, well, what do we do now? I said, that's up to you. It's your learning experience. Now, the first thing they had to do was they recognized that we were in that class as students, not as teachers. And therefore, if we didn't learn anything, we would walk out. And I have walked out of such classes because I wasn't learning anything. Therefore, what do they have to do before that course begins? They're going to have to find out everything I've said about the subject so that they don't waste my time. And they learn all I know about the subject before the course begins, not after it begins. I don't waste my time telling them what's written and out there in the literature. That's what they have to pick up. And their job now is to educate me in there. That's their job. But who are they really educating themselves in the process? At the end of the course, we don't ever give an examination. What a stupid way to evaluate people, examinations. Is there any situation in the real world where you were evaluated by examination except in the civil service? <laughs> how do you evaluate people? By how well they can do a job, right? If I give you a job to do, 
Do I tell you you can't talk to anybody else? You can't read a book? You can't use notes? Hell no, I want you to get the job done. I don't give a damn how you do it, but get it right. But you teach them that they have to do it in complete isolation, which is never the way they're going to work in the real world. It's stupid to examine them that way. And to evaluate them by how well they can imitate a combination of a tape recorder, a videotape machine, and a permanent file. You know, how could they regurgitate what you've told them? What an incredible way of evaluating. You know how we evaluate students? Every student in a cell has to evaluate every other student. But he doesn't evaluate them in terms of how much the other student has learned. He evaluates each student in terms of how much that student has taught him. Each student evaluates every other student as a teacher, not as a student. And boy, that really separates the ones that are good from those who are bad. You can't teach something you don't know. And therefore, if you've taught somebody something and he says so, then you know that. Well, that's only the beginning. There isn't a single aspect of the educational system that can't be stood on its head and you come out better for having done it, no matter what it is, whether it's examination, whether it's courses or curriculum. Just look at the way we organize <coughs> curricula. We divide it up into courses, right? You come out of school with a certain set of conceptions in your head. Reality consists of physical problems, chemical problems, biological problems, psychological problems, social problems, political problems, philosophical problems, so on and on and on, right? There aren't any such things. That's an absolute myth. There is no such thing as a political problem, a financial problem, a social problem, a marketing problem, a military problem. There is absolutely no such thing. Those adjectives in front of the word problem don't tell you a damn thing about a problem. But we convince everybody that it does. It tells you something, but it doesn't tell you anything about a problem. What does it tell you about? Well, let me tell you a story. In the 1970s, late 60s and 70s, we were working intimately with a so-called urban black ghetto just north of our university. It's an area of 22,000 people in 80 city blocks called Mantua that in 67 initiated a self-development project. And in 10 years, they completely transformed themselves from the worst slum in Philadelphia into a more desirable residential area. They got 17 national awards, were the subject of seven national TV programs. They did absolutely incredible things on their own with help that they got only when they asked for it. There was a meeting of the leaders of that community in my office one day, together with a group of the professors who were trying to help them. And in the middle of the meeting, somebody came in with a piece of information to stop the meeting dead. It was a marvelous 83-year-old woman in the neighborhood who had undertaken the task of organizing what's called a geriatric set, the old people in the community into an active development force, and she had done an incredible job. They had opened six infant care centers. They had cleaned up lots, these old people, and converted them into recreational uh, spots. They planted flowers and trees and they, all sorts of things. And fortunately, we were able to do something for her. That neighborhood had absolutely no medical facilities within it. With the help of the University of Pennsylvania Hospital, we opened up a clinic in the neighborhood that was free to all members of the neighborhood. So that once a month, she could go to the clinic and get her health checkup. She had a bad heart. That morning, she had gone to the clinic for her monthly checkup. They had checked her and found she was okay, and she had left it to go home. Home consisted of a single room on the fourth floor of an old converted large house as characteristic of a slum. On the third flight of stairs up to her room, she'd had a heart attack and died. Now, that's the news that was brought to us, okay? The long silence in the room. Finally, the professor of community medicine who was present from the medical school said, God damn it, I've been telling you guys we need more doctors. If we had more doctors in that clinic, we'd be able to make house calls, and this never would have happened. There's a silence in the room, and the next one to speak was a professor of economics who was there. 
He said, you know, there are plenty of doctors. Trouble is, they're private practitioners and they cost money and she didn't have any money. If we had better welfare payment or coverage of medical expenses, she could have called a private practitioner and he would have come to her house and it wouldn't have happened. Another little bit of silence. And the third person, a professor of architecture, spoke up. He said, why don't you make them put elevators in all those buildings? The fourth person to speak up was the only woman in the room, a professor of social work, and she shook her head. She said, my God, you people don't know anything about that woman. Don't you know that she has a son who's a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania Law School, who's a partner in a major law firm downtown, does extremely well, he's married and has two kids, and they live in a beautiful bungalow out in Balakinwood on the main line. If she weren't alienated from her son, she'd be living with him or she'd have all the money she needed and no steps to climb. Now I've got a question for you. You tell me what kind of a problem that was. Was it a medical problem, an economic problem, an architectural problem, or a social work problem? Old age problem. <laughs> no, it's not an old age problem. <laughs> it was just a problem. The adjective in front of it tells you nothing about the problem. What it does it tell you? It tells you about the point of view of the person looking at it. So if somebody says that's an economic problem, what he's telling you is he's an economist. He's not telling you anything about the problem. He's looking at the problem as an economic problem. That means he's an economist. And certainly with physics, chemistry, marketing, and so on. The fact is we don't know what's the best way to look at any problem. But our education leads people to believe that the first thing you do when you're presented with a problem is find out the file drawer to go to. Do you go to physics, chemistry, biology, or so on? We equip them to do that. And that's the worst conceivable thing you can do to a problem. What you have to do is look at it from a wide variety of perspectives to find the best way. There's an old story, a joke that's told in academic institutions which illustrates this beautifully, a freshman class in physics. Professor turns to the class and says, suppose I give you a barometer and give you the job of determining the height of the Empire State Building. How would you do it? One of the engineers in the class raises his hand. He said, okay, how would you do it? He said, I would take the barometer and go to the base of the building and measure the atmospheric pressure. I then go up to the top of the building and measure the atmospheric pressure. And by using a familiar law of physics, I would convert it in the height of the building. The professor said, great, that's fine. That's exactly the way I would do it. And he started to talk about something else. The second student raised his hand, a student in physics. He said, what's the matter? He said, I would do it a different way. He said, you would? He said, how would you do it? He said, I'd go up to the top of the building with my stopwatch and take the barometer and drop it <laughs> and see how long it takes to reach the ground. And then I would convert it by S is equal to one half GT squared and the height of the building. He said, very good. He said, I hadn't thought about that. He said, that's right. You can do it that way. He started to talk about something else. The third student raised his hand and the professor said, oh my God, now don't tell me you've got a solution, you're in business. The kid said, well, I do. He said, all right, how would a business student do it? He said, I would take the barometer to the janitor of the building and say he could have it if he told me how high the building was. <laughs> There are an infinite way, number of ways of approaching any problem. But we teach people that there is one way and it's defined by the discipline. Look, a discipline is nothing but a filing, a system of organizing knowledge in the file system. If you come to my file in the office, the first two things there are Alcoa and Alcoholics Anonymous. Does that say they have anything in common? Hell no, it's just a way of filing information. Doesn't tell you anything about the content to say they're in the same file drawer. <clears throat> now I can take that same file and reorganize it by dates. I haven't changed the content at all, but it might be a lot more useful. Disciplines are constructs of man, and they're becoming less and less useful. Do you realize that in 1900 there were only six recognized disciplines in the United States? You know how many there are now? Over 250. We have to keep multiplying them. There must be something wrong, because we keep talking about them about as though the universe is organized the way education is. 
and nothing could be further from the truth. The universe has no correspondence to the way we've organized education, but we convince people that it is. Now, we perpetrate one misconception after another in the educational process. Let me just mention a couple of others. I'll tell you a story first. I have a very good friend who's one of the leading statisticians in the United States. He loves puzzles. We were having lunch together one day. He said, I got a new one for you, Russ. I said, okay, what is it? He said, you got a ball full of balls. You reach into the ball and you pull out N balls. Out of the N balls, M are black and N minus M are white. He said, now, you're going to reach in the ball and pull out one ball. What's the probability it will be black? He said, now, that's really a tough one. Be careful. I said, that's easy as hell. He said, what do you mean it's easy? I said, you tell me how you know that the ball has only black and white balls in it, and I'll tell you what the probability is. I said, oh, no, no, no. He said, you're changing the problem. I said, what do you mean I'm changing the problem? You told me that the bolt contains only black and white balls. You must know that from somewhere. I want to know how you know that. He said, no, 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 you're spoiling it. I said, I don't understand. Why are you depriving me of information that you have? He said, all right, I'll change it for you. He said, we got a glass ball. You can see inside of it, and you can see that every ball is white. You take out the balls and split them, and inside is either a black core or a white core. You got M black cores and N minus M white cores. Now tell me what the probability is that the next ball will have a black core. He said, how do you know that all the cores are either black or white? <laughs> he said, God damn. He said, you, he said, forget about it. He said, got a slot machine. <laughs> there are two exits, one on the left and one on the right. You shoot N, N times. And M times, it falls in the left-hand pocket, and N minus M, it falls in the right-hand pocket. What's the probability the next time you pull a ball, it will fall in the left-hand pocket or the right-hand pocket? I said, give me a screwdriver. He said, why? I said, I want to take the machine apart and find out how it works. He said, no, you can't do that. I said, why not? He said, because I said you can't. Now, what he was asking me to do was to find a solution to a problem in which he was depriving me of the information which he had used in formulating the problem. That's not a problem. That's an exercise. In the real world, our success depends on our ability to use the information required to formulate problems in their solution. But we never teach kids how to do that. We teach people how to solve problems that are given to them, but not how to take problems. And in the real world, problems aren't given to you. You have to take them. Furthermore, as I'll tell you right after we break for the film, there are no such things as problems. They are absolutely abstract concepts that have no correspondence to reality. And yet we spend all of our time teaching kids how to deal with them. What does reality consist of? Not problems, but something else. We'll talk about that something else when we come back.